This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Definitely improved. It's blue skies, nice little strong breeze, more of a wind. You can see how it ripples in the water. Looking forward to it. Hopefully going to be another great afternoon here at Brightlands. Welcome everybody. My name is Chris with me on camera ops today. Still my friend BK and you are live with us on Safari right here in the greater Kruger area. And we are at Leopard Dam. With us at Juma will be Cedric and Tessa. And remember, you can send us comments and questions to hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. You can also head to our live safari page, website, Wild Earth website. Head to the live stream and leave your comments and questions there. And kids, you can also participate send your email question or comment to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv temperature wise very mild it's not cold not cool not hot it's just a nice easy temperature no need for a jacket at the moment which is pleasant we'll start off this afternoon with a little experiment now I should have done this a while back, but we've got a few days to just see how much the water evaporates and how the, the actual shoreline retreats as the water goes. So we're going to hopefully look at this in a day or two's time. And um, just as a bit of an experiment, see how much and how quickly the water evaporates and disappears. Right, plan for the afternoon. Easy walk, gonna be just looking at small things. <laughs> Sorry about that. Goodness. And I'm gonna ask you to send me comments as to what you would like to see. Okay, and this is not animals, it's not referring to animals, big game. That will track in the mornings. More specific topics. If you want to know again more about grasses or just their specific trees or would you like to know more about the geology? Would you like to do some tracks? Should we do some track and sign ID? So send us a few of those and I will basically take the first two topics that I receive and we'll sort of make that the central theme of the afternoon. Obviously, if we do find fresh tracks of any big game, we will certainly track them but that's opportunity based, as I always mention. Well, I've told you exactly what our weather is like. I think this is a good opportunity to take a look at the overall weather in all our locations. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a very sunny Juma. Such a huge change from this morning with that very heavy, overcast, thick, cloudy weather. But I've started my afternoon at the Hyena Den just to catch up and see if Ndebele is still here. It looks like she is still in the entrance and we've seen some of the younger cubs as well. My name is Tess. I'm going to be your guide on safari for the afternoon. Behind the camera is Panda and once again, Please excuse my voice. I'm so sorry. <laughs> At least I'm not barking as much anymore, but now, of course, I sound a little bit like a husky foghorn. So we'll see how it goes for the afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And if you can't, 
I'm sure that MC will let me know. Uh, it is a perfect winter's day. Uh, this is more what we're used to for our winter weather. Nice clear skies, a little bit of a breeze, nice and hot. Not too hot, not cold. Perfect. And that is exactly why I decided to start my afternoon at the Hyena Den instead of coming here a little bit later because it's cool enough that the cubs might come out and start playing. Now we have seen Intima's cubs, we've also seen Corky's cub. They have come out to greet us and they've just gone back into the entrance on the other side. But we're hoping that if we're patient for the next little while, we might see them come out again. Maybe even glimpse Swazi's cub, ribbons or hearts. But hopefully the biggest of all we'll see in Debele's cub slash cubs. Ah, there comes one of the other little ones. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens. Each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day. For a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! Now usually I'm so distracted at the hyena den that all I'm focusing on is all of the action because of course we're trying to get to know each individual cub, there's so much to learn. But I'm noticing more and more every time I'm here. Spas, some of the most common animals that will inhabit old hyena dens are things like porcupines and warthogs. In fact, I remember getting the fright of my life going past Ribbon's Den site when it was still on Twin Dams and um, three warthogs popped out of the entrance kind of teenage warthogs and I thought to myself that's a little bit weird how are they in there if the hyenas are in there so I thought maybe the hyenas had moved and as it turns out they hadn't so they were co-inhabiting the same termite mound which is quite strange so as it turns out you don't even need to have the hyenas move out if you want to move in in the right circumstances but yes usually it would be things like warthogs even things like I suppose fox, pangolins as well porcupines, anything that would live in a burrow, because why dig your own if there's already an existing one that's nice and comfortable? The only thing that might bother them is, of course, a clan of this size. They couldn't really co-inhabit because there's just too much activity, but uh, also the pest load. So things like ticks and fleas inside the den site, they might have to give it a bit of a break before they inhabit it to let all of the pests disappear. A lack of food will hopefully help them disappear and then they might inhabit an old den site. Now I have noticed there's some new flowers at the den. There's little yellow flowers hanging over Ndebele's head and all the way down the side. And those look like wild hibiscus. It's the first time I've noticed them at the den site. I think I've just been too distracted by all the action every time I've been here to notice the flowers. Wild hibiscus. What a strange time of year to find flowers at the den. But anyway, it sounds like Cedric is ready to say good afternoon. So I'm going to sit here and be patient and send you over to him to say hello. Yes, good afternoon. It's uh, what a wonderful way to start this uh, sunset uh, drive here at Wild Earth. As you can see, we've got a big male elephant 
And it's just uh, milling around, yeah, slowly but surely moving northerly, in a northerly direction towards Biffleswick cut line. Yeah, Juma Private uh, Game Reserve, South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold, and behind the camera this afternoon, we have got Gert. So thank you so much for joining us on our Sunset Safari. And as you can see, uh, we've already had a, a great start with our hyenas at the den. Of course, Tess uh, definitely hit the jackpot there. And yes, we've got a big male elephant and slowly moving north. We did have a herd of elephants in front of him that's already, already gone over uh, Biffles of Cutland towards uh, Boabab Dam. But they've moved quite far. Maybe he might just be following in pursuit, but definitely not not highly uh, mobile for a big boy like this. Yeah, I think he is more in a mood to uh, eat and uh, move and eat and move and eat. But yes, it's so nice to see these big male elephants around here at Juma Private Game Reserve for the last few weeks. Absolutely wonderful animals. Find a way into, into the kill to eat. Get their fill in there as well. But they're also gonna be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys. Let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. Yes, uh, well, th we did get an update this morning that Tabung Gubing came south from Bobab uh, Dam, so that's just uh, north of us. And uh, Cara, that female leopard, uh, she as well came south, not too far east of us, on uh, just uh, close to Aubrey's Road, into this block. So we are going to just do a little bit of a search. I think those are the tracks that I found uh, not yesterday, the day before, heading up and down, up and down on Aubrey's and uh, I'm just hoping that we can find them. It'll be so, so wonderful to see Cara again. Uh, I haven't seen that female, so it is gonna be so exciting if I can get to view her for my, uh, for the first time, uh, for my record. And of course, uh, Tamagumi, one of the male leopards that I really enjoy, is a pretty, pretty boy, and uh, he is growing into a nice big male so yes definitely we will be searching for those two around here but yes please send your comments your suggestions to us let us uh, keep you guys uh, entertained and uh, ask us questions hopefully we can answer them and uh, while we continue down uh, the sandy patch road let's head over back to tess while she's sitting there at the hyena den Definitely a lucky start to the afternoon, Said I'm loving it already. I'm hoping we find some elephants this afternoon as well. For now, I am playing the patience game. I don't want to play it for too long because obviously we want to look for other things as well and show you other things. But I also know it will be worthwhile if Ndebele's cubs do come out. And I know that the longer she is there for, the more likely we are to see the cubs, especially when she's been lying in one position for a while because then she needs to reposition and that's mostly when we see her moving her cups just so that she's more comfortable you know what it's like if you sit in a funny position you get a dead leg all animals are exactly the same so i'm sure she's going to want to reposition soon now the little cubs so i'm talking about corky and Tima's cubs we haven't seen swazis today yet have gone wandering through the grass 
on the left hand side of the den so they're getting to that age now where they're starting to really explore the world around them they're somewhere in that thicket we can just hear movement and then every now and then we see a head or two pop up out of the grass and they're at that age now where they're exploring they're sniffing things they're chewing things they're learning about the environment outside of the den and pushing further and further away from the den every single time so when you look at all the different animals you try and predict for the little ones at what age will they start moving off from the den when will they start hunting when will these things happen all the milestones and i always find myself surprised at how early they do it compared to what we think they will and compared to what the literature says because most literature says that the hyenas won't leave the den and participate in hunts they won't go too far until they're almost a year old and these little ones are still very young they're not nearly as old as ribbon and hearts cubs who are almost Oh, seven months now, if I'm not mistaken, might be older. And um, yet they're adventuring. So it's always a pleasant surprise when you find them exploring their environment. Now they don't leave for too long, they do end up coming back. Hayley, I agree. Every single time we see these cubs, they seem to look stronger and healthier and bigger with sharper teeth and stronger jaws. So it's a fantastic learning curve for anybody, but particularly for naturalists and guides as well, because we don't get chances anywhere else to spend time with hyenas and learn them the way that we can learn them here. But I remember at one point we were worried about Swazi's cub. It looked like it couldn't really walk properly. And I know there were a lot of, a lot of viewers at home who were concerned. And <laughs> it's amazing now. Swazi's cub is uncontrollable with energy and speed and strength. So it just shows you, you know, we, we worry more than we need to sometimes. <laughs> If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. It must be quite an experience to be a hyena, especially to be a cub as young as these ones, so adventurous and curious, the strongest noses, so many smells to pick up, so many things to learn. Endless adventures, the world is literally their oyster at this, at this age. The diversity of cubs that we have here at the moment is really just unparalleled to any other den I've ever spent time at. But those hyena cubs, I think, have definitely gone for a longer walk than I anticipated. So we'll see if they decide to come back sometime soon. I'm going to try and reposition to the other side. And speaking of walking around, let's head over to Chris and see what he's up to on Bushwalk. I had a few responses to my suggestion that topics being sent through. 
Uh, just got a few I'm going to isolate for now. Uh, Honey Badger wants to know more about the geology and tracks. We're going to start off with some tracks soon. Uh, birds, plants that birds usually feed on. Susie Miller, we'll definitely see if we can cover that. Um, also, we got Mac 23 GLS wants us to locate something that we don't normally see. And we've got CNAC. Can we talk about the hunting strategies of wetland birds? Definitely, all very good topics. I'm gonna to start off with a track for honey badger. And it's a track that we had before. It's a fairly common nocturnal bird here. And easy way to identify this whole group of birds, subfamily is the fact that the track there's no visible hind claw very distinct ball and where normally these most birds the outer toes will be equal in length we can clearly see the one toe usually the inner toe is shorter than the outside toe and the middle toe is grouped closer towards that inner toe and that's very typical of the coursers you can take a look there can see exactly the same structure the distinct ball the shorter toe with two segments which you can't really see that well here and then that middle toe that's sort of off centered closer towards the inner toe there in this case the courser that it probably would be is a bronze winged courser very likely to be that one So we'll definitely look for a few more tracks as we go on. Talking about water birds. And that eat plants. Here we have a Yeah, we have a track of an Egyptian goose. Again, this distinct ball, no back, long toes. And here you can't really see the webbing, but you can see how the webbing has flattened those soil particles there. So that would be typically the track of a spurwing goose. I thought spurwing goose, the uh, Egyptian goose. The spurwing goose will be much bigger. It will be about, that toe will extend up to about there. All right. And they feed mainly on plants, usually grasses and those type of things. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Well, it's not as graceful as <laughs> he's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's gonna do it, but let's see. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. look if we can find anything relating to those topics we mentioned earlier in the meantime let's go over to Cedric who is doing some birding yes uh, well, welcome back here as you can see we've got a beautiful black bellied bustard so nice to see uh, this bird. Oh, it's the first time I've seen the black-bellied bustard on Juma Private Game Reserve. As you can see, that beautiful black line that's coming all the way down its neck, in front of its neck, and it's got this beautiful, like, kind of a black smiley face at the back of its head. 
Absolutely stunning. And of course, a little bit uh, uh, larger compared to your uh, red crested uh, Quran or red crested busted as well. So it is a little bit larger. And of course, they are pretty much all African ground dwelling uh, birds. So they do roam along the grounds and looking for little insects. And we've just been witnessing as well, been picking off uh, little ticks off the grass blades. So many times you'll find that you get those like rhino ticks or even your little uh, black pepper ticks that sit on the grasses and it'll just pick it off. But they have got one of the most beautiful calls of, uh, actually guests always used to laugh when they listen to the call because it's got this typical, it goes and like a popping noise and it's so, so awesome when they do it. And usually when the male does it, he'll be situated on top of a termite mound and he'll actually make that call, of course, just displaying to a female and also letting other males know that this is his area. But yes, on Sandy Patch clearing, this is where we have located this bird. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, Tyler, I guess the, the look, the red crested uh, bustard has also got really much the black underpart on the belly, but it hasn't got the black on top with like got that smiley face on the on the head, or as well, it does not have that long, beautiful black streak and line down the front of its neck, and of course that's where this one gets uh, the name black bellied uh, Quran because of more of that black streak that runs down. Unfortunately, it's just gone into. Uh, a little bit thicker stuff, but we'll just give it a, a couple of minutes. I'm sure there is some little open areas that he'll come through. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. But yeah, but they also they are omnivores. So sometimes they do feed off some things like little fruits, seeds, berries. So they do also feed on uh, that uh, those kind of things. So they are omn uh, omnivorous, but uh, their main diet is of course insects. So even ants, you're looking at little beetles, grasshoppers, ticks. So I'm just uh, just combing and going through these uh, grassy areas. And easy for them just to. Uh, pick them out. They lay around about uh, three uh, eggs um, and of course they lay the eggs on the ground. They'll make it under a real thick areas in the grassy areas and they'll hide, hide those eggs in a little grassy little spot for themselves. But yeah, while we're going to continue watching uh, this beautiful black bellied bustard, let's head over to Tess while she's sitting with those hyenas. So we have figured out where the rest of the activity is. Everybody is sleeping in the shade behind the termite mound and in fact the younger cubs are busy playing still. But we have got Swazi, you can just see her kind of back right leg over there. Hello Swaz, having a nice sleep. 
And then out and about in the shade, we've got a mix of Swazi's cub, which is busy interacting with Ribbon's one cub at the moment over there. Ribbon's other cub is behind that thicket that you can see on the right hand side. <laughs> and then we've got... <laughs> That's so cute. We've got Ntima and Gorky's cubs busy terrorizing everyone, it seems. So much fun being had at the den. So that is Corky's cub that's just come over to Swazi. Oh, about to get disciplined. Not for you. And here comes Antima's cub. Brenda, yes, male hyenas do come to the den site. I think it just depends though if you're talking about natal males or migrant males. Because <clears throat> remember the natal males from this clan will move to other clans. But the migrant males will come in and they do occasionally visit the den. <clears throat> so we have seen one or two of the males here at the den site, but not regularly. We mostly see the females. And that makes a lot of sense because they're the ones that interact with the cubs. The males don't really. Oh my goodness, it's got a bone. I don't know if it's just me that thinks this, but I feel like Ribbon's cubs, when they lie down like that, look a bit like bat-eared foxes. Just Ribbon's cubs in particular look a bit like bat-eared foxes when they lie like that. I think it's because of how fluffy they are still. Look at those paws. Such a mischievous little face. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! So Antima's cub is absolutely intent on chewing Swazi's tail. Probably not the best idea. But still a fun learning experience. Definitely at the chewing age. Oh, that's very true. The other day they were actually, the lions were chewing on each other's tails. That's so funny, the lion cubs from the Nkuhumas with Cedric. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, there's something about tails and predators, I'm telling you. Maybe it's the movement or the easy kind of shape of it because it's fun to chew on. <laughs> Amazes me how much these cubs 
can blend in so easily as soon as they sit still. There's Swazi's little one right at the back going around the den. Stephen, to an extent, yes, older cubs will try and help and look after younger cubs, whether that's just playing with them and, and grooming them. You know, that's obviously more common, but uh, when it comes to feeding them and defense, probably not as much because the basic instinct of any cub is to protect themselves. But I mean, a cub with more personality, so for example, Corky's cub or Hart's cub, both are very strong personalities and Corky's, you can understand, being the matriarch's little one. They do tend to interact with all of the other cubs a lot more and all of the adults as well. So they might be more inclined to defend other hyenas or run into disputes where, for example, Ribbon's cubs aren't as forward with that. But it's not the same level of care, of course, that the adults would give. It's more of a play learning kind of experience and occasionally grooming each other, but mostly with hyenas because of those big teeth that involves a lot of biting each other. I suppose you can call that care. <laughs> it's how they do it. So more and more we're noticing there's a lot of very good little hiding spots at the Sten site and a lot of playgrounds. At the moment, Swazi's cub and I think one of Antima's cubs are up on the slope, kind of navigating their way through all of those roots and stems and branches. It's like a bit of a jungle maze. <laughs> Lost a bit of balance there. Ah, I found a stick. Swazi's little one. One thing we have noticed as well, Ribbon's cubs tend to be a lot more subdued than Hart's girl. Most of the time when we're here, you will find Ribbon's cubs here and they're either sleeping or they're, you know, interacting with the others where Hart's cub often is completely nowhere. We don't know where she goes. She goes on adventures and then she comes back and plays with the cubs. But she doesn't sit at the den site and sleep. She's much more adventurous than that. See, the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him. Hyena and Hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little Hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Maybe Hippo jaws gaping. It's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby Hippo against all odds. I haven't noticed from this side, I haven't noticed any movement from Indabele. We can't really see the entrance nicely though from here. We're obviously tucked away around the back of the den site. But we are going to keep watching just in case she does make any bigger movements. Because this is the entrance on this side where she came and fetched that cub the other day. So it sounds like Chris, who's asked all of you for some topics and ideas to talk about and things to do, has got something to show you. So let's go have a look at that while I wait for the hyena cubs to move into the sun. miss those little cubs a lot. I eh? have to get to see them soon. 
Oh, geology. Okay, what I'll do a little later, we're going to try and walk around here at Red Earth because there's a variety of rocks here. So I'll try and see if I can't build a picture here of how the geology works in the part of the Lowfeld. Very interesting is that if you look at a map, the geology map of the Lowfeld, if you start in the west along the mountains, you start moving eastwards towards the eastern parts of Kruger, you almost see these strata, this like north-south bands of different rock types, starting with this granite gneiss that we have. It extends all the way from just the mountains right into almost the center parts of the park, and that will include the geology at Juma. And um, that's the oldest rock that we have in this region, dating back to some sources, say even two billion years. Now, granite is what we refer to as a plutonic intrusive igneous rock. Uh, a lot of these rocks are granite. Some of it is metamorphosized granite called gneiss. But with granite, how that forms, it's magma that are solidified deep below the Earth's surface. It gets pushed up away from the mantle but it then cools down. Remember, this is a whole cocktail of different minerals. In terms of granite, there's a whole bunch of things. Quartz, hornblende, which is a black mineral, feldspar also. Um, and then what happens is because it takes a long time to cool down and solidify, it gives time for these minerals to attract each other, and they form large crystals of those. That's why with granite, you often see things like quartz, and these things, and even more so when it's put under more pressure eventually to become gneiss, which we'll get back to later. And then you can look at the crystalline structure of granite. I mean, everybody who's got granite tabletops will know that. Those little rocks, you know, me, uh, uh, table. You can see the big individual crystals in granite. Here's a beautiful little one called mica. It's that little silver stuff there. Very rich in a mineral called silica. It's got this almost like plastic, shiny like appearance. Uh, Jennifer wants to know if we found any rock arts of any kind up here. Not on this part of the world. In the Greater Kruger there are a couple of well documented sites where mainly the sun or the bushman used to do art. Um, you would need mountainous areas with overhanging rocks. You know, that's typically where you'll find this. Not so much where we are. We don't really have the mountains. Um, but in the greater region, I'm talking further, deeper into the actual national park, there are a few uh, rock art sites. I'm talking about rock art, when I was at Tualu, we had some beautiful um, engravings in the rock there, which is not really, we call it petroglyphs. That was quite pretty to see. This is amazing. And now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah, here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's got... The elephants have huddled up to protect the young ones in the middle and he's going after that girl. And they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness, they're still going after them. Look at that guy charging, hey! Lauren, as your underwater biologist. We have a turtle! So this is the knife symbol for a turtle. So today is not any ordinary day, it is World Ocean Day. Christopher wants to know if I'm able to estimate how old the rock is and if it's still hard. Uh, Christopher, 
Not personally, but obviously as part of our studies, as guides, we do have to study our local geology quite quite in detail because that's the basis that was laid for all of this, as you see here. It's got a massive influence on in what eventually happened here. Uh, the granites are said to be 2 million, two billion years old. Uh, remember that not all the rocks we have here is granite. So what also happened at a later stage, after the granite was formed, due to pressure, it got reheated and it changed the crystalline structure of the rocks. So things like quartz, it becomes a liquid at a very low temperature uh, and it also caused cracks in the rock. The quartz becomes liquid and it fills those cracks and we often see these little bands of quartz in here. So that is younger than the actual granite, but its origin was from the granite two billion years ago, according to geologists. Let's head over to Cedric to see what he's up to while I find more rocks. Yes, uh, well, Chris, I know Chris loves his uh, rocks and he loves showing everybody all different kinds of formations of rocks ar around these areas. But here I'm standing now on a huge formation or sand formation that you can see sitting above the ground. So now this is, of course, a termite mound, also known as a termitarium. So this is where uh, termites will live, create these huge mounds, and of course, uh, taking a lot of different food sources inside of the mound. But First thing, this uh, termite is known as a, a macrodermis, a natalesis termite. So it is a large fungus growing termite. So what these termites, so you, well, you only see about an eighth of it, the rest of it's all underground. Now, why I call it a large fungus growing termite? Because as you can see, not uh, much grass is around here. So what they do, they'll actually take the grasses deep inside of the mound into the chambers. And inside of the chambers, underneath the ground, it's kept around about 27, 28 degrees Celsius all the time. So it's a good temperature for fungus to start growing on the grasses that they've taken into those chambers and then they feed off that fungus. So that's why they are, they pretty much farm their own food. But in these termites, it's all controlled by, of course, a queen, a queen termite, and she's around about 12 centimeters large, and she can live up to about 20 years old. And she is an egg-bearing machine. You can imagine she lays around about 30,000 eggs per day yeah, inside the mound itself. So that is a lot of, a lot of eggs. And of course, as you can see, it is winter time, so a lot of these uh, holes that they usually keep open in summertime have uh, closed up, and the whole reason for that is just to keep that heat inside of the mound so, of course, for that fungus to grow. You'll find in summertime, once it starts getting really hot, they'll start opening little air vents around you just to release a lot of the hot air and as well, once again, just to reg regulate that temperature inside of the mound. But as well, this uh, soil that's all around, <coughs> all that you see around you is very high in minerals and very high in nutrients. Kumani, Kumani, good afternoon. How many termites does it take to build a mound this size? You, Kumani, you know, as I said, 30,000 eggs per day. Uh, Kumani, there is hundreds and thousands of uh, termites that's underneath the ground right now where I'm standing. So there's lots, maybe almost up to a million. Um, there's so many, because you only see an eighth of the termite mound on top here. The rest is deep underground, uh, seven eighths of it's deep underground. So there is millions of termites that <laughs> to take to build these mounds. I had many years ago, I had a guy that specialized in termite mounds and uh, he showed me quite a few of the termite mounds around here looking at different sizes and a lot of them dated to about 200, 250 years old. So I mean those uh, mounds, those big mounds are really, really old and what happens if the queen dies, of course, if there's another queen and a king that comes through, they'll start a whole new colony because as soon as the one queen dies, that whole colony will disappear. So yes, but yeah, thank you Kulani for that question. Thanks for joining us on Wild Earth on our sunset safari. But
that, as I said, this is very high nutrients, very high minerals. So a lot of the grass, a lot of the trees that grow on the Termite Mound grows to big trees and very, very lush grass. So and you'll also find a lot of the uh, herbivores that will come and feed around you. As you can see, the grass is pretty much flat around these Termite Mounds, very sweet uh, grasses. But yes, I think let's uh, move on. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. While we continue searching for those uh, two leopards, Kara and Tavangumi, back in the northern areas, let's head back to Tess while she's still sitting at that hyena den. Oh. How brilliant would it be to see Kara or Tavangumi or both? Wow haven't seen Kara in a long time. We are still at the hyena den and it looks like we are getting more and more active. So we've got Swazi still sleeping but Corky's cub is adamant that it is going to pull something out of the ground there. It looks like a stick but at the same time every now and then it looks like she's also or it is also biting Swazi's tail and behind isn't Tima's cub. having a tug of war match with a little stick on the floor. Now Hart's Cub has decided to make an appearance because Ribbon's Cub has moved around to the front of the den. So Hart's Cub is now lying where Ribbon's Cub was, just curled up. You can see it next to the bush there on the left. <laughs> There she is, nice and curled up. And Ribbon's other boy has just come out of the entrance. So this is the more calm cub of Ribbon's two boys. He's a bit more reserved. And he tends to be the one that follows the lead of the others. It's a good question. I hope I'm saying that right. But um, yes, it's a very good question. The cubs are chewing on everything because they're not necessarily teething the way that we would because they don't cut teeth out of the gums. They're born with teeth. But they are teething. They're busy strengthening their jaws and they're strengthening their teeth and sh sharpening them. So it is a teething process, but different to the normal teething process where babies chew on things because their gums are itchy. The hyena cubs don't really have itchy gums, they just have a lot of teeth that need to be occupied by doing something and at the same time it helps them strengthen their jaw muscles and their bite force. But you can see hyena cubs don't just chew with the teeth, they chew with their whole body. Look how they pull on the sticks, they're literally strengthening the upper body, the core strength, the neck muscles, the face muscles. Everything gets used when a hyena is chewing and that is all in preparation for chewing bones on carcasses, pulling carcasses away from leopards and lions and each other. 
and really just preparing them for a life of being an incredibly powerful predator. Look there, every single time they chew they are pulling, they're not just chewing. It's as though they pick a fight with everything they chew. So I don't know if you noticed, but yesterday when we saw Nabele picking up her cub, there was a beautiful view into its mouth because she picked it up by the head and there was a stunning view into the cub's mouth. And you could see all of the very nice pearly white teeth in amongst those very pink gums and tongue. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. If you are a Wild Earth Explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. And looks like in Tima's cub, the one at the back now there, has a quite a mohawk on it. I don't know if it's just me, but it's got a very fuzzy little ginger patch in between its ears. Look there. That's quite cute. It's like a little crown. It stands out quite high compared to the others in between the ears. That's where Swazi's cub is, it's suckling. We just couldn't see it because it's in the long grass. I only noticed it now because she lifted her, hair, her leg and I could see a bit of the head. She's got it literally in between her legs. She's got her legs resting over the cub. I think they're trying to bite Swazi's tail again. And Tima's cub is definitely trying. Pixie Bell, hyenas, I don't know if you're talking about trying to synchronize it to other predators, um, or if you're just talking in terms of other hyenas in the same clan, but comparing it to other mammals and other predators, they're not quite as specific as things like leopards and lions who will try to give birth leading up to winter. And that's quite evident with the clan because of the different ages of the cubs. In the next few months, the older cubs are gonna be closer to 10 months old already, where the youngest cub is gonna be closer to one month old. Ndebele's cub if we look at kind of July and August coming up and um, particularly around the time of August you know heart and ribbons cubs are going to be 10, 10 months old or so so they're definitely not as seasonal so we've got a massive range of cubs born over almost a year which is very very impressive I know that it doesn't always happen perfectly with predators in particular. So for example, Shudulu losing her cubs is mating again. So her new cubs, if she falls pregnant now, are only gonna be born closer to spring instead of closer to winter. But normally, leopards, lions, and wild dogs are quite seasonal. Wild dogs are the most seasonal of all of them. They den this time of the year. They mate around April and they den, so they actually have their puppies in a den site in our winter months, May, June, July. That's normally when they would be denning every year. They don't den in summer. 
But if you look, compare that to things like elephants, which is the biggest mammal we have here, they don't really have a season. So it really depends what you're comparing the hyenas to. I don't know if this is unusual for the clan because obviously I've only known the clan since September last year. But I think it's very impressive that we've got cubs of so many different ages. But what I find most fascinating of all is that obviously Swazian and Nabele being sisters from the same litter, I find it very fascinating that they've both come into Estrus and both had cubs within a month and a half, two months of each other. That for me is absolutely brilliant. But compare Ndebele to Ribbon, and you've got two entirely different seasons and cycles happening there. Even to Heart, you can see the size difference from Heart's cub. I hope I'm saying this name right, Naki, I think it was. Uh, no, the other hyenas won't necessarily bring food for Ndebele and the new cubs. Remember, the new cubs at this stage are only going to be drinking milk, so that that isn't an issue. But of course, Ndebele needs some very high quality protein to make the most nutritious milk of any of the carnivores. So she'll have to go out and get food for herself. That being said, occasionally, especially if a hyena wants to get away from a kill quickly, will take a whole leg or something like that and bring it, purely to eat away from the commotion. And in that case, yes, then an Nibelian Swazi might eat if it comes back to the area of the den site. But it's not an active, okay, let me bring a leg and drop it off here and then I'll go back and finish eating. Hyenas will gorge themselves and come back. Whether they bring food back or not is purely dependent on the situation and where the kill is and what's happening around the kill. It's not quite the same as wild dogs where they feed themselves, come back and regurgitate food for the babysitter and the pups. Oh my goodness, Corky's cub is so active. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool. So now it looks like all of the activity is really starting to come to the fore. All of the little cubs seem to be starting to chew things. So hopefully that just continues to stay that way for the rest of today and tomorrow. It'll be exciting. All right, it sounds like Chris is on a bit of a bumble. So let's head over there and see where he is on his way to. We just got back to the car. Like I said, we'll do short little walks. Uh, we just in transit to another area. I was thinking to go just do a little loop around Buffalo Pan to try and see if we can find anything interesting there. We haven't really walked around there much. So I can't really tell you what I'm expecting. But we certainly will try and see what, if there's anything interesting. Since a week and a half ago, I didn't have any water. Now suddenly, 
Yeah. It's got a bit of water, so it might be a good idea to just go and check out. So we're just en route there now. It will take us probably about 10 minutes to get there. Anyway, so we, what I'm hoping to hopefully see is some tracks of creatures we have not seen yet. Perhaps, I honestly don't really know what I'm going to expect there, if there's going to be anything, but I think it's worth a shot. Susie Miller is asking in this season what would commonly be seen around the Pridelands. Well, um, hi there Susie. Pretty much everything that occurs here, you know. Um, a lot of the migratory birds are gone. So from a birding perspective, we see fewer birds species-wise, not necessarily numbers. Those that are living here that don't migrate, we see them in their normal numbers anyway. And I mean, we'll probably see pretty much the same bigger animals. They, they, they don't really move much, you know, in terms of the season. You know, we don't really have migrations in here. But insects definitely in this season, there'll be a lot less insects. A lot. Notably fewer insects. Flowers will be less. Um, one thing that might happen is with water, as the drier season approaches, we had late rains, you might find that uh, some areas will have an influx of elephants and some not, and we can't predict whether we are going to be one of those or not. So it's not so much the season that causes the animals to move away other than the birds and the insects. It is more a case of the wet season makes it trickier to find them. I like the wet the dry season. Find a way into into the kill to eat. Get their fill in there as well. But they're also gonna be told off. It's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys. Let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bourgeois' field guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. get ready now. Grab my stick and uh, BK will get his stuff ready to dismount and we'll go and investigate if there's anything. Worthy here yeah, to, to look at. Demi wants to know what are the most commonly found insects in the dams. At the moment, probably mosquitoes, or rather mosquito larvae. But there's so many to name. I can't even attempt to answer that. Insects is just one of those things that are 
thousands and millions of insects. Species-wise, we are even discovering species daily. Not me, but I mean science. And I've, when there's some scientists that reckon there are species that have become extinct even before they were discovered. So yeah, there's a variety. But dragonflies, often around water, they breed in water as well. So from the larger insects, probably dragonflies being the most prolific. But there's a whole bunch of aquatic invertebrates that are living, not necessarily insects. Well, we try and find some interesting little things around here. Let's go over to Tessa at the hyena den. little time spent with the cubs now before I head on. It looks like most of them are out and about. Swazi's cub has just woken up from a good feeding session and is chewing sticks as is expected. Hey little one. Ribbon's cubs are both sleeping as they have been. And then of course one of Ntima's cubs as well as Corky's cubs seem to be trying to irritate as many of the other cubs as they possibly can. So there you can see a very cute interaction with Corky's cub and Hart's cub on the left, Ribbon's cub on the right. <coughs> oh cute. Everybody on their backs now. Wow. Synchronized napping. that naughty face you can just see it's full of beans chewing things doing all of the hyena cub stuff that it should be doing and as for the rest of the clan everyone still seems very relaxed <coughs> excuse me Sandra, in terms of space, I don't know if that'll be the t determining factor of the clan finding a new den, but yes, they might have to find a new den sometime soon. The older cubs are not really as reliant on it anymore, but the younger cubs in particular, so Corky and Tima, Swazi and Ndebele's cubs, they are more dependent on a, on a persistent or constant den site. And so, due to the paste load, due to the smell, yes, the clan might have to go and look for a new den site sometime soon. We don't know where it'll be, we don't know when it'll be, but at some point I'm sure they're going to start gradually moving cubs somewhere else. And then we'll have to play the catch-up game again and see if we can figure out where they've gone. Hopefully it shouldn't be too difficult with so many cubs, but you never know. Stunning. So that little one that was walking through was in Tima's more bold cub. The other one I haven't seen in a while. It's busy napping somewhere. But we're going to leave the clan now to enjoy their afternoon of fun hyena shenanigans. And I'll send you over to Cedric, who seems to have found some. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm glad uh, uh, Tess could spend some good quality time with the Juma clan. Always nice, always nice to see the little cubbies all out playing. 
Uh, we're at uh, Buffelzook Dam. We've got a nice big female elephant that's on the dam wall at the moment. It's moving away slowly with a little calf, but there is more elephants in the background, so it looks like there was quite a nice herd uh, that came through here. I think we just got the, the stragglers here at the moment, the ones that's just slowly moving behind the rest of the herd. And it's always nice just to watch them, just watch them feeding and moving on and... Uh, I was actually hoping they were going to come down to drink. I don't know if they had a drink already. It looks a little bit wet. But let's see. So it keeps on thinking about the female. It keeps on thinking going, of going down to the water edge and maybe having a drink there. But uh, now again, she looks like she wants to go. But no. But as you know, a big female like this, a good old 4.2 to about 4.5 tons. So it is quite a, a large and heavy animal. Well, of course, the males will be much larger. Oh, yeah, she's going to go down. No, no, she's not. No, I think she's just going for a nice grass that's sitting there at that uh, buffalo thorn. Looks like she's enjoying some nice lush grass. Just sitting around the base of that tree. Of course, the male elephants are around about six tons, so of course, your males are much larger. Oh, what's upset the birds? Yeah, something upset the Franklins. I'll just quickly get my bifocals out here. I'll take a look. Why is this everything going so crazy here all of a sudden? <laughs> a lot of alarm calling here. Maybe a bird of prey. Sorry, uh, Chulu, you say, Erin's saying, uh, sorry, what was that question again, Chulu? Erin, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, uh, it's strange to find a female elephant without a herd. Yeah, most of the times they're in the are with the family herd, so um, she has got the rest of the herd. Um, as I said, I think the rest of the herd for this female and the youngster, uh, I can get a lot of branches breaking and a lot of feeding and movement uh, not too far from where she is. I'm, so, I'm sure she's with the rest of the herd, yeah. But that does happen. I've seen females break off from herds, maybe a... A little bit of a dispute in the herd itself and uh, sometimes you'll find a female will just break away and uh, sometimes she'll actually even break away with her own calf and then slowly but surely start another another family or another herd. But uh, this female, as we uh, see, she has got uh, the rest of the herd with her. And uh, yeah, most uh, of course, uh, when it comes to the family herds uh, of uh, elephants, it's all related, family related. So it's all the moms, sisters, grannies, aunties. And oh, look at the little one coming up there. There's another one. The little one, yeah. yeah. As you can see, the rest of the, the rest of the herds. See, even another little one coming through. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. If 
definitely the rest of the herd is coming out here slowly but surely that female is going to drink it looks like she wants to go and drink i'm just going to hang back a little bit hopefully the rest of the herd comes to drink because it will be fantastic i love elephants when they do stand around the water areas having a good old drink it looks like she's she's chosen a quite of a quite an angle to go down yeah, I'm going to see if we can get a little bit of a better spot here, a better angle for us, so we can view them having a little bit of a drink. Oh, bye, bye. Let's see if we can get on top of this side. Let's see what's going to be the best. Yeah, we'll try our best, yeah. Let's see. It'll, ask, it'll tell me now, but I'm sure on top of this... Uh, area here will be a perfect little spot. All right, thank you, Gert. Well, also, it's not too I'm sure they will come down, so we're just uh, going to play the patient game, but there is definitely quite a nice herd uh, behind her. I can see lots of elephants pulling through now uh, to uh, Buffelsuk Dam. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us on, self, uh, on our Sunset Safari and Wild Earth. Uh, what will the little calf do if it sees a predator? Well, of course, it'll uh, kind of uh, trumpet a bit and 10 to 1 with a little bit of a complaint. And very quickly you'll find that the, the females in that herd will come uh, to uh, that young one's uh, distress call. And uh, you'll find that uh, they will surround the calf very quickly. They are very protective over their calves. So yes, but he won't go for the, if there's lions, whatever, he will be tentative. It depends on how old as well. Sometimes you'll get the younger ones, very young calves, and they won't push through those boundaries with big predators like the lions. But uh, yeah, sometimes you'll find your, your mid-age ones, even the elephants from about age of uh, just 9, 10, 11 years old, they might push uh, the boundaries and come and uh, chase the predator off. But you'll usually find it's a females that will pick up on that quicker. But let's enjoy the scenery while we see all these elephants coming down to drink here at Buffelsuk Dam. Charles, good afternoon. Definitely, uh, the family element of elephants is always fantastic. It's just uh, has a very strong bond in that family, herds, and really protective over each other. And a lot of respect to the matriarchs, of course, usually the oldest, the most experienced female uh, will be the matriarch, and I do have a lot of respect for her. because She's the one that's going to decide where they're going to go and drink next, where they're going to go and eat next, and where they're going to move to. And they put a lot of trust in her. Beautiful with that reflection on that water as well. Absolutely stunning. So we had lions here yesterday, we had buffaloes here yesterday, we had elephants here today. So Buffalo Dam has been really productive. Arian. Darian, Arian. Sorry, I couldn't copy that name. But uh, will the elephants uh, tell if there is a crocodile around there? Will they tell if there's uh, the presence of a, a, a dangerous croc? I'm sure that will. I'm sure they will pick up on a croc if it is moving slowly towards them. It's, uh, you know, they've got very, very good sense of hearing. But I've seen it before. There, I've seen a video before where a croc was actually drinking water and uh, a croc, the elephant was drinking water and uh, there was a croc exactly where those elephants were drinking water and of course that uh, crocodile latched onto the trunk 
of the elephant. And of course, there it just shows you the elephant did not even know that the croc was around. So yeah, it depends uh, if the croc is moving towards him and the crocodile decides to move towards him and it's on top of the water, I'm sure the elephants will pick up on that. But if it's underneath and uh, by chance they drink exactly where that crocodile is, I'm sure then it'll be a bit of a surprise. How many is in this herd? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Six, ten. Ooh, quite a nice family herd. <laughs> in that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Oh, it's not as graceful as. <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's going to do it, but let's see. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. <laughs> Look at those two, absolutely having a lot of fun here. Yeah. While well, the parents are busy, well, mom and auntie and everyone is busy. <laughs> Drinking water. And of course these two little calves are really having a lot of fun here. Yeah. Mm, what of a push and shove game. I just, they are so adorable these little ones. We had some fantastic elephant sightings as well this morning on our sunrise safari. <laughs> Poor little blacksmith lapwing is getting out the way there. <laughs> yep, out the way. <laughs> They're chasing the bird. Oh, yeah, they can chase the bird. <laughs> of course, those youngsters are all right around about maybe two, two and a half uh, years old. Because the other one that's just coming in there now, almost maybe a good little three and a half, four years old. As you know, the, the, uh, the tusks will start appearing at about four. Rosemary, good afternoon. Yes, definitely also one of my favorite scenes. A real African uh, scenery, this, when you see a, a beautiful waterhole like this with uh, a herd of elephants coming down to drink. Um, it's just so tranquil, it's so heartwarming and... Uh, you know, it just gives you that real African feel uh, to it. But thank you, Rosemary, for your comment. Thank you for also joining us here on our beautiful sunset safari. And of course, we've got a, a female hippo that's all by herself still the side. We've seen her for the last uh, few days. Just uh, being by herself in this uh, dam. Why well, I say hippo, it's, she's got that uh, pink around the eyes compared to the male that's much darker as well. You know, if she really lifts her head out, you'll see there's a lot of pink underneath the ears. And what a beautiful afternoon. You can see the blue skies, a little bit of clouds around. It is definitely a, a beautiful scenery. A person can just sit and listen out.
William, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for the comment. Yes, I also do love it. It looks like the Ipa is always staring at us and making sure that we are in place and uh, we're not going to come close to uh, their watering hole. I think it's, uh, it does look like it. I think this one's eyes is closed now. They're catching a little bit of a sleep. I'm sure she's making sure she gets a little bit of rest before she starts moving out at uh, at night. I'm going to go head out and have uh, some grass, certain grass species that they do enjoy. And uh, sometimes they can venture out quite far. And uh, as before the early morning sun rises, the hippos will pop back into their watering hole and rest for the day again. But she's not too bothered about the elephants being around, yeah? Well. And while we're sitting here and watching this beautiful scenery, let's head back uh, to Tess. I think she's got some beautiful antelope to show you. Nothing like a herd of elephants at water. They just get so excited. It's always amazing to see. Now I know this isn't a very clear view of what we were looking at because of the wide angle into the sun, but what was really catching my attention, other than the impalas you can see moving, was actually the way the light is catching the fresh leaves, which does not happen at this time of year. But of course there is actually a bachelor herd of impalas. They were right next to the road and now they've started moving off into the thickets and they were covered in ox pickers and in fact there was even a yellow billed one. So it is very exciting. So many things that we didn't used to have are here. Now the bulls, the rams, sorry. <laughs> are still displaying a bit of rutting behavior, even though that one that you saw there that was horning the bush, even though he's quite young, he's not old enough to be mature to be mating, he is still horning the bushes and showing aggressive behavior. It is very impressive, very, very impressive. But let's see what they do. They are disappearing quite quickly, so we might lose view. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. So I'm up on Philemon's cut line and in fact the impalas were out on the old fire break, so the old cleared area and that was how I noticed the ox pickers but now it seems like, seems like, seems like they are moving into the thickets and still kind of showing each other a bit of aggressive behavior, still kind of pushing each other around but it is definitely calming down to what it was throughout the month fitting that on the last day of the month we're seeing a little bit of action but not nearly as much as we used to from the impalas. The end of the rut is coming soon.
And I think that might be the last proper glimpse that we get. Unfortunately, I didn't get to show you the yellow bulldog picker, but that's okay. It was here, and that is the most exciting part of it, considering they used to be locally extinct. All right, I'm going to send you back over to Cedric. He is still with the elephants, and I think that might be slightly more exciting than the greenery that we are witnessing now. Yes, we just started taking a look at these young elephants and they are having a, such a party on the other side. I think they're teasing each other and running up and down and one's bumping the other one. And you know, these, the young, these typical young elephants having a bit of playtime. <laughs> Picking on the small ones now there. And it just shows you their bond becomes really strong, especially if it's female elephants and they're going to be together for many, many years or for the rest of their lives, because these uh, bonds become very strong in these herds. And coming to the ages of elephants, you'll find that the elephants around in the, in the Greater Kruger National Park, uh, elephants will get to about plus minus 60 years old. Uh, the reason for that is all to do with wear and tear on the teeth. So of course, elephants do have six sets of molars, and those molars do act like conveyor belts. So, if, of course, the first set of molars have worn down, you'll find a second set coming through, and so on, until the sixth set is kind of worn down. And then, of course, and then they cannot put that amount of vegetation into their system anymore. But uh, you'll find elephants around there in Botswana, they'll get to about, around about plus minus 70 years old. And the reason for that is... So uh, they eat much softer vegetation, reeds and grasses, and compared to our elephants that eat much coarser stuff. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! It looks like definitely it's time for them to start feeding. Oh, While well, we're going to continue from Buffalzook Dam, let's head over to Chris in Pridelands. Uh, he's got something to show everybody. on the vehicle uh, buffalo and didn't really yield what I was expecting it's just a lot of buffalo tracks that's trampled everything there a lot of squishy mud not much there to report so we're on route now to the drainage line and we just had to stop here at Impala Plains where there's all sorts of things happening and starting off with this group of dwarf mongoose this is just enjoying this late afternoon winter sun and the temperature is dropping we can feel the breeze is getting colder yes impalas around all sorts of birds which we'll bring to you soon And this little guy is just sitting there on his log and he is enjoying the sun. 
almost like their cousins, meerkats. You see, they're quite spread all over here. Well, we're going to stick out here for just a little bit. There's quite a lot happening here. In the meantime, let's go back to Tess, who is with an elephant. love dwarf mongooses. Chris, that sounds adorable. I have got something on the total opposite end of the spectrum. A massive elephant bull on Philemon's cut line. He is quite a tusker as well, so I'm hoping he turns so that you can see the glint of his tusks because they are very thick and they are very big. He's very gentle. He's definitely not in must. He's not leaking any temporal fluid. He's not smelling strange. So there's no signs of must. He's being a true gentleman this afternoon. Other than the fact that when he first approached the marula tree, he looked like he wanted to push it over onto us. So I backed up a little bit just in case. But I feel like that's just good manners anyway. <laughs> So we can't really get around him at this point because there is a massive termite mound on the side of the road. Otherwise we would have gone around to show you the view from that side where the sun is coming from. But there's a giant termite mound on the side of Philemon's cut line and so we can't off-road around him. So we're going to be patient and wait and see what he does. If we get a chance, we'll go to the other side so you can see him in the sun instead of the shady side of him. But for now, it is fantastic anyway to be in the presence of such a gigantic gentle giant. Well, you can see the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh there we go, nearly got him. Hyena and hippo walking side by side, terror etched on the expression of little hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby hippo jaws gaping. It's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds. So what I might try and do, if he takes another few steps off, then I'll try and go past, but for now I'll wait. Honey Badger, that's a really interesting question. I don't think I've ever been asked that one before. No, I wouldn't think that a damaged trunk would affect communication between elephants. It might temporarily affect things like feeding and drinking. But when it comes to actually communicating with each other, most of it is vocal. So a damaged trunk won't affect the voice box. It'll possibly change the pitch. Oh, he has moved. Let me see if I can move forward. It'll possibly change the pitch of something like a trumpet, if he's trumpeting. But in terms of the rest of the communi communication, it comes from the voice box and that very low rumble as well. It's all coming from the voice box and that's picked up often through the vibrations through the feet. So it's actually got very little to do with the trunk. The trunk is much more for feeding and drinking than for anything else. Well, he is gorgeous. I'll try and pull in here and then we can have a nice view of those tusks. Wow, look at 
Look at those eyelashes as well. He is massive. Looks like he's broken this tusk, so it's not as long as the other. It's got a bit of a jagged edge. You can see the other one is much longer and sharper, so he's broken this one off at an angle. It's almost parallel to the ground. But what a gorgeous boy he is. Look at those eyelashes. Now the pink behind the back of his ears is not something we get to see very often. I think the only reason we can see it so nicely now is because we're very close and it's facing into the sun when he flaps his ears. And that's very likely just a bit of old age. Remember flapping those ears all the time, they get exposed to the sun, so there might be a bit of sun damage. It's very thin, sensitive skin so that the blood can flow close to the surface and he can get rid of body heat. It's all very well adapted for cooling down, but maybe not the best adapted in terms of sun damage. And he's an old bull. He's well into his 40s, I would assume. So he's had many years in the sun. you have some eyelash envy I agree I get eyelash envy every time I look at elephants and every time I look at giraffes I wish I had some of those too my brother was blessed with the most beautiful long curl, curled curvy eyelashes they curl right up almost to his eyebrows he's got amazing eyelashes and I did not get that gene but that's okay I make up for it in personality. <laughs> this elephant makes up for it in everything. He doesn't need to make up for anything. Now he has had a dust bath at some point today because I can see there's a lot of very red looking dust on the top of his back there, just behind his shoulder blades. And that's quite important for him for a few reasons, but probably in this temperature, the sun would be the most important. Fiona, interesting question. It's actually a combination of both. So the genetics of the elephant will determine a few things, length of eyelashes, length of tail hairs, length of the tusks, overall size, maybe the shape of the head, um, weak knees. So genetics have a large factor to play with that. Even the back of his ears being pink might be genetic. Maybe he's got weaker skin than another one. Very similar to humans. Some of us are more sensitive than others. And it'll also be determined by feeding so I don't mean feeding as in this elephant ate more bush willows than the other elephant that's also around the corner I mean in terms of the area so if you look at Addo elephants they don't have marula trees they don't have all of the vegetation that we have here they are stuck with Albany thicket they used to occur there naturally but if you look at the size difference between Addo elephants and Kruger Park elephants it's enormous. They've introduced four elephant bulls from the Kruger Park into Addo to change up the diversity a bit. And you can see the Kruger Park bulls coming from a distance because they're a meter taller, minimum a meter taller than the Addo elephant bulls. And that's just habitat. So it's not necessarily just diet, it's the overall habitat and the environment that they're found in, combined with genetics that will shape what an animal looks like, how big it is, what its strengths and weaknesses are. So it's a very interesting topic because it can go in so many different ways and the slightest little things can affect it in ways sometimes you don't expect. But probably diet is one of the more predictable ones. Genetics, however, can be predictable but can also be completely unpredictable with things like mutations maybe a surprise visit from a different male that you didn't know was around so those are the things that would really change it up a bit I'm going to see if I can roll us a little bit backwards although I doubt it but let's try anyway put the clutch in and no movement so start the car I'm making panda work hard today. Every time I move, he has to re-level the camera and all the areas I'm choosing to go are very uneven. <laughs> it's 
Sorry, Panda. This is amazing. And now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah, here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's got... The elephants have huddled up to protect the young ones in the middle. And he's going after that girl. And they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness. They're still going after them. Look at that guy charging. Hey! Lauren, as your underwater biologist. We have a turtle! So this is the knife symbol for a turtle. So today is not any ordinary day, it is World Ocean Day. So he has not moved far and the entire time we've been here he's moved maybe 20 meters. So it just shows how much he is feeding because he's a big boy, he needs a lot of nutrition. So he's going to be capitalizing on this nice wet area of the seaplane. So the seaplane holds a bit more water. So the greenery here is a lot thicker. It's a lot more nutritious. And he is absolutely capitalizing on that. Maybe that's why he doesn't need to go for the marilla leaves because there's so many bush willows. But he has decided enough is enough. Now that I've said that he hasn't moved far, he's decided, let me put on some speed and head off then. <laughs> Those tusks are massive. Wow. What an honor to spend a bit of time with him. He's the biggest tusk I've seen here in a while. Body size and tusk size, he's very big. And just like that, he melts away as though he was never here. Unbelievable. You can kind of still hear him moving, but that's about it. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> lucky, lucky, lucky. Very big bull. I was hoping we'd find some elephant action this afternoon. I was getting a bit of FOMO when Cedric had them. It's a very relaxed afternoon though. I like the feel of this kind of afternoon where it's hot, but now it's starting to get cold even though the sun is shining because of the slight breeze, cooler temperatures in winter. Everything feels very still. Love it. Now I am hoping that the wind blows me in the direction of the Nkuhumas. We're gonna see how it goes though, because this morning when Cedric left them, they crossed onto Torchwood where we cannot traverse. So I'm hoping that maybe the wind has blown them back towards Gauri Main, maybe Chitwa. <laughs> and then I'll have a chance of viewing them there. But if not, that's okay. The wind blows us in all directions and it's so unpredictable and I love it. getting cool enough now that I'm ready to put my jacket on. How crazy is that? So early in the day. All right, Chris is on quite an adventure it seems, so I'm gonna send you over to him to have a look what he's up to on his bumble while I have a quick stop here to put my jacket on. Checking out some trucks here and for a moment there, it tricked me thinking it is a leopard truck. But it is unfortunately a hyena. Sure. All right. That's just, I was, was driving now. I'm going to get a little bit higher towards the hills. You can maybe see if there's not a nice spot to climb. See if there's not anything there. And just saw these tracks. Oh, well, on that, so why is it not a leopard truck? I mean, that, at first glance, you drive a second gear that could be easily a leopard track. 
just that almost as if there were three lobes, man. But there you've got the toes and you've got the pad. And this type of sound, the track doesn't have a good definition. So it's good, very well. That's when, why when you then have to backtrack or go further to look for other tracks to confirm. But the toes are too close to each other. And we can still see that kidney-shaped toes on the side. And then definitely not the three lobes in the back. And then if we look further back, we can see here the hind foot much smaller than the front foot. So even though there's not a lot of definition, it clearly points out that that is a hyena and not a leopard. Bummer. I really thought we're in for business because that's it's nice tracks. Very, very nice tracks. Hmm, talking about leopard, we are um, just going to drive around here, hop out of the car every now and then, look for interesting little things it seems like today is a bit slow i think this morning soaked up all our our luck <laughs> but yeah we still got we got some time left and um what we're going to do now we're going to probably do a bit more vehicle based stuff drive around Hi there, Sammy. Is it Sammy? Is asking um, what other animals would have similar tracks to hyena and leopard. Well, lion, young lions could look similar, but you know, it's obviously a cat, so like leopards, there's technicalities on the tracks that are different. Uh, wild dogs can also be similar, but they are smaller. And wild dogs, being true dogs, you'll have typical dog like. Um, back pad like a triangular pad you'll have the middle toes sort of a little bit forward and then even further forward the front two toes there and with true dogs as you can see there because this is now an exaggerated track but you can divide it into perfect thirds so the pad the middle toes and the front toes so it will be three which you can't really do that much but you know there's too much of an overlap so that will also be for domestic dogs and a jackals and so forth so literally a jackal you'd have the back pad you have the two side pads the toes and the front toes and that's what i'm saying you can literally do it with a stick and measure it lion will be like a leopard similar in appearance but much bigger even bigger than this that will be a very young lion if that were a lion Anyway, so this is not something that we will follow. It's not f fresh enough. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. I just got a feeling we're gonna be lucky with something there. And we've got about 45 minutes of sun, so we're gonna try and use that to see if we can't cover a little bit more ground as opposed to being on foot. Other than that, it's been very quiet on Brightlands in general, even the radio. I think there's only one elephant that we've seen, which is unusual. Badger is asking where will be a good place 
to learn about South African geology. Um, and in fact, I would suggest there's multiple publications on the geology of South Africa. Very complex. It's one of the most varied countries in terms of geology. There's so many different types of rocks. The low felt here is a good place because, you know, of that difference, as you go further west, all sorts of different rocks and almost in the little strata. Um, especially when you hit right up to the escarpment. Do you remember the escarpment, the Drakensberg Mountains? That already is spectacular. And then if you head further south, on on that head to Nelspruit, Barberton, that area, there's actually a geological route there that's very well documented, um, where there is some um, ancient, ancient granites, for instance. You can head down to the Cape. The Cape's got unique mountains there, formed in a very different way to some of the mountains here. So I suggest, this, or my suggestion would be to obtain a few books. Um, I can't recall any specific books. But there's a number of guides that can, I think one is something like geology off the beaten track or something like that. But very nice shows you different routes different than the well, obviously examples of these rocks as well right let's see what tessa is up to while we drive closer to the hills just so enjoying soaking up the sun today it's such a lovely change whenever it's really overcast and the sun comes out it feels like it's been forever since you've had the sun on your back <laughs> but with panda now just chatting about it when you're sitting still it is so warm it's lovely you can take your jacket off sit with your back into the sun and you actually kind of get quite hot and as soon as you are moving or in the shade that sneaky winter breeze is on us, and it's cold. <laughs> so I think I'd rather be safe than sorry with my chest and put my jacket on. And I'm very happy I have because even my hands are cold now that they're in the shade and in the breeze. But I'm if you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. If you are a Wild Earth Explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. quickly going to pull off the road, sorry, I am on Gowrie Main, so it is unfortunately a bit of a thoroughfare and there is a vehicle behind me, transfer vehicle or something, so I'm just making sure that they can get through and don't have to sit in our dust because they tend to drive a little faster than we do, we take it nice and slow, but I'm hoping there's going to be something at Twin Dams. That is my next stop. My next stop. Definitely feeling much better with the jacket on. Interestingly enough, we've hardly seen any leopard tracks recently other than for Tlalambas. That, it kind of makes a bit of sense because it's been so active with the lions the last little while, so the leopards can obviously smell that. But, um, 
strange not calling in leopard tracks. Feels weird. But lion tracks, it is so good to see. Every time we see them, I feel like we, we get overly excited because we don't often get to track lions anymore. And I mean, just massive tracks on the road. So exciting every time you find them. There have been a ton of elephant tracks, uh, corrugations, which makes tracking more interesting, more difficult, that's for sure, because they can cover leopard tracks and lion tracks very easily. But it's all part of the challenge. It's not necessarily tracks that the predators are using as much as it is scent. So anything that walks has a scent. I mean, we have a scent as well. As much as we can't smell it when we put our hand down like that, a leopard would be able to smell that or a hyena or whoever would be able to smell that. And so they would use the scent to find prey as opposed to using um, the actual tracks themselves. Because remember, predators don't need to be using their eyes. Their noses are much stronger and so are the ears. So that's what they'll use. It's just easier than looking at the ground and following, trying to follow a footprint which can be washed away where a scent, even if an elephant steps on top of the scent of an impala, the scent of the impala is still there. It's just a bit more muffled as opposed to the track being completely gone. So it wouldn't actually make much sense to use the scent, I mean the track instead of the scent. the wild Cedric. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Always fun chatting when you see people. <laughs> All right, let's see what we can find. Heading along Garamain. I checked all along here yesterday for those teleporting lines. Still no sign of them. we can find. I'm going to check this little pan system off of Leadwood Road. Maybe we'll find some leopard tracks there or who knows, maybe even just a warthog burrow or something cool that we haven't seen before. And I will send you over to Cedric who is also on a lawnmower. I know that Tess wanted to come to Twin Downs and I think I beat her, yeah, because I just saw her going past on Curry Main. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tess. But uh, yes, as you can see, we've got a beautiful Nile monitor on the other side on the banks there. I'm just trying to see if we can get it there. Uh, there, there. Yeah, just enjoying uh, the sun. Of course, they are ectothermic. So, of course, enjoying the nice late afternoon sun, just warming up uh, their body and using the last bit of light from the day. But not a big one. I think it might be the same one that we keep on seeing moving from uh, this uh, dam and going down into the Molawati and catching those little sand frogs and coming back again. Yeah, but yes, they do hunt uh, little fish and frogs inside the water as well. Are very good swimmers, these Nile uh, monitors. But yeah, you can see because sitting on the western bank, uh, on the eastern bank now, why on the eastern bank of the dam? Of course, the sun is setting on the western side, so the sun only hits the eastern bank, and the western bank of the dam is very much under shade at this point of time. So they utilize that, uh, that sun as much as possible. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, 
it's a river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! Oh, Laura Moore, good afternoon. Yes, it is such a gorgeous afternoon. Not a breath of wind. The sun is uh, really sharp. The golden light is coming through. I like this Nile monitor as well. He's just enjoying that, that sun, or well, the last bit of sun that we are having for the afternoon. But yes, oh, Laura Moore, thank you for joining us here on our a beautiful sunset safari on wild earth once again always a pleasure having you watching us but yes so while we're taking a look around there, there is a uh, seems like a gray heron a little bit further on the uh, inlet of the dam Uh, Steph, uh, no, they won't die. It's just that they won't be as active. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, if they don't want to hunt and they're too cold, look, they, they, of course, their body temperature will be way down and the movement and uh, mobility be, will be way less. But uh, they will still look around maybe for slow moving and looking for things like eggs or chicks in uh, nests and all that. So they can still do that. They'll still move, but they won't, uh, they won't die but it'll just uh, make life a little bit, or actually not a little bit, quite a bit more difficult for them. As you can see as well, this beautiful gray heron is uh, waddling through the uh, the water. Of course, with a lot of the grass is underwater at the moment there. I'm sure a lot of fish is taking a refuge and hiding in uh, that clump of grass that's still in the water. I think that's exactly what the gray heron is doing is really kind of focusing on something that's moving. But let's see, maybe we're lucky with a kill, but he's still looking around. And we'll see, they do move very slowly through the water. They don't want to create too many ripples. See that very steady, steady steps, steady steps. There we go. Into, into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also going to be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, cows. Let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. I wonder if it caught something. No, it didn't. I thought it caught something. It did strike there. I think it missed. So it definitely got some movement in the water. I love watching these grey herons. They are absolutely fascinating. Just to watch how they hunt. And just, uh, of course, their method of hunting as well. It's brilliant. 
We had a, a hippo the other day there at Bifusuk Dam where the grey heron was using the hippo as like a, a platform just to stand on and uh, enjoy the early morning sun. And he was surfing the hippo. And there's a lot of little tilapias in here. And that's the main uh, food source, the main diet of the grey heron. A rain, good afternoon. Is a grey heron and a blue crane closely related? No, uh, uh, rain, uh, they're not, uh, that, uh, the crane is not part of a heron family. Um, so they're not... I don't know how closely related they are. I'll just have to take a look for you on that uh, on that one. It's a, um, I mean, I don't. I, I haven't even seen a blue crane in my entire life, so I'm not even sure. Um, but yeah, I can just take a look for you if it is, um, or how close they are related to each other. But yeah, good question. That train. Right? It's always one of the things I enjoy. Is uh, I'll, and asked a question, something that I cannot answer, and I have to go and look it up. Keeps us going as well. And just because uh, it's yeah, in the bush, you'll definitely not know everything. I wish it was the case, but uh, it's always a learning curve. Every day is a learning curve for us as well. Looks like that grey heron has seen enough around that area. I think it definitely wants to work in a little bit of a maybe a little th thicker area of where the grass is situated. Maybe it might be lucky. And there's still frogs around as well, so you'll still see maybe that uh, leaf folding frogs that sometimes you will get around still at this time of the year. It just shows you, and that's, a, and that's an inflow now. It just shows you how, still, how much water there's still around. I mean, almost the entire legs is uh, submerged into the water. You can see how deep it's going there now. Oh, yeah, just another thing as well. On Penguin Beach, I know that Jack's... Uh, she did show a lava, and uh, she sent me a photo of that lava uh, yesterday and just took a look at that lava and uh, looked it up. And it was one of the beetle species that you do get around the coastal areas in the Western Cape. I'm not too sure exactly the beetle species, but it is a lava of, uh, of, of a beetle. Um, but of course, there is quite a few different species that you do get in the Western Cape. So. Um, I have to really see more of the size and exactly where um, I picked it up, but it's definitely a larva from a, one of the species, a beetle species, that you get there in the Western Cape. Might be lucky now. Strike. It's got its arm something. You can actually even hear the African green pigeons in the background. Oh, did it get? No. <laughs> Almost. That was unlucky. Missed one. Missed opportunity. The Egyptian geese at the background as well, African green pigeon, a lot of bird activity, a lot of noises around uh, twin dams at the moment. Uh, it is quite peaceful, but 
There's some nice uh, bird calls and bird songs that's happening around us. And it sounds like there's African green pigeons uh, sitting in that jackalberry, that big green jackalberry that's on, on picture at the moment on the screen. It sounds like those green pigeons are coming from that, or the noise is coming from that tree. Of course, <laughs> all the jackal, all the berries itself, all the jackal berries, are, I'm sure maybe feeding on some of those uh, little berries around there. But they're all beautiful green in color. And they're there somewhere. <laughs> They'll be definitely hidden between all those leaves. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. I think, uh, yes, I think we're going to carry on east. We're going to carry on moving. We're going to carry on going towards Chira Cut Line. And we're going to go and see what we can find that side. But while we do that, let's head back to Tess and see what she has found on Chitwa. Good luck, Sid. I hope that you found something amazing. I am on the boundary between Chitwa and Torchwood, and we have found the lions once again. It is not the best view because, of course, we cannot off-road to where they are, but they're just north of the fire break, just to the east of Chitwa's main driveway. <coughs> and at this point, we are seeing flashes of tail and ears and a bit of moving vegetation. Ah, there you go. There's one of the cubs. It amazes me how well they camouflage just by sitting down. Now, luckily, when, when we were driving past, somebody moved. And that was the only reason I noticed that they were here, because we are the first vehicle here. There is nobody else here just yet. But it is so wonderful to know that they are right there. All right, let's see what happens. Sorry, the radios are doing their own thing today. But we're going to hope that now that it's getting cooler, we might get them moving. That would be the ideal. 
But in that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Oh, it's not as graceful as... <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's going to do it, but let's see. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. really am making panda work very hard today. So we saw one lioness get up and move. And I'm currently off on a little mitre drain so we're not, that we're not in the road. But I do want to see if we reposition a little bit, if we might get a slightly different view, maybe a little bit further forward. Let's try from there and see. You never know because the lioness got up and walked. A little bit further north and west. So the little ones are likely to follow. But I just have a feeling we might get a better view from here if they do start moving. <sighs> Look at the grass. The grass is amazing. <laughs> It's the current situation that we have right now. Knowing that there are lions there definitely helps. Billy Wild Guy, the largest cat in the world is actually a tiger. Lions are the second largest. And the third largest would be jaguars and then leopards. Lions are the biggest of the cats that we get in Africa, but in the world it's definitely tigers. And tigers are bigger than lions by a shocking 100 kilograms. They are massive, massive, so big. I have never seen a tiger in the wild, but it is definitely very high up on my bucket list. I tried to call this in. Oh, I'm just seeing bushes moving. I think the, the cubs are starting to play, which is a really good thing. I called this in earlier, but I don't think anybody was really out and about yet. So let me try it again now. Stations, um, in case you missed the updates earlier, I have relocated on those in Kuhumas, the three Mafazis with the seven month one, just to the east of Chitwood Driveway on the northern side of the road, just north of the firebreak in Torchwood. Oh, I see tails. I see tails. Hello, cubs. Nice to see you. Even if it's just your ears and tails, I can deal with that. A little bit of line action. <laughs> it's so funny. We It's so funny, we're picking up the movement just from the trees, just from the bushes moving, and then you see the odd cub. There we go, hello little one. All right, we're going to try and stick it out a bit longer and see maybe the patience game pays off. Let's head over to Chris and see what he's up to on bushwalk. Right, we've got about... Five to eight minutes before the sun is going to set. So we're just trying to get to a nice elevated area. We haven't had a nice sunset now for two days. Well, none, basically. And we are definitely going to have a sunset this afternoon. So we're just going to... That's why I'm driving a little faster than usual. I want to 
and get into an area where we've got a lovely view. We won't have time to climb a hill though. Uh, we've driven past there, no sign of any cats. Um, it's probably, we, we're probably due for a quiet afternoon after all the action from the last couple of days. <laughs> warnings elephant that was angry at us and all sorts of things happening at Brightlands. So let's, ah, oh, here's the road. I think here we might actually get a very nice view. I'll need to drive a little bit and see that we don't have any funny angles or something. I really want to get down here. things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. We're going to have to get to an area with with a glow. Yeah, Cedric is doing some birding. Oh, that is beautiful actually. Let's go over to Cedric while we position for our sunset. Yes, that sunset is beautiful. The sun is stunning this afternoon. As you can see, it's hitting, that sunlight is hitting this batalia just perfectly. You can see that beautiful reddish-orange face of the batalia. So that's uh, the crest. It's just really waving in the back of its head. Really, really beautiful. A bird of prey. Oh, don't look away, look this way. As a known as a short-tailed eagle. So that's just a, a new uh, name that's coming through as well, short-tailed eagle, or of course old name Batalia. Now Batalia is actually a French word that means a tightrope walker, so many times if you see a Batalia really flying or soaring around, and it'll kind of be rocking from side to side. And just like a tightrope walker that's walking on these tightropes with their balancing sticks or poles. And uh, it looks like the batalia is balancing on that rope. But of course, a bit of prey, just like the vultures and the tawny eagle, uh, the batalia uh, is a scavenger. So it does feed on uh, anything, any dead animals that's around the area. But they are really, really beautiful birds around the side. They're actually one of uh, our endangered species, believe it or not. You wouldn't think a batalia would be endangered, but uh, because if you come into the, the park or the Greater Kruger National Park, you do see quite a few of them just here, very much congregated due to um, the wildlife. 
but you never really see a batelier going further out from the parks itself. And so they're very much contested in just those certain areas. So they are uh, put under the list, the endangered species list. I think also just due to a lot of uh, uh, human uh, habitats that's taken over the areas of these wild areas. And of course it's difficult to see them further out. Chulu, you have to go with that message again, please. Can you just go with that question? I didn't pick that up. I think I just got a lot of scratching there. Emily, good afternoon. 12 years old. Uh, thank you for joining us on our sunset safari. Uh, all the birds of prey, yes, they are all carnivores, so they all pretty much hunt for themselves or they will uh, scavenge, uh, just like this batelier. So they are all carnivores. So they do just eat uh, meat. Well, some of them, of course, bone marrow. You get certain birds of prey that will actually uh, drop uh, bones from high up. And uh, I'll actually drop it and I'll actually shatter the bone and go for the bone marrow. But uh, yes, all the birds of prey that we do have here, that's why they call it a prey, because they prey on uh, on species around these areas. Oof, look at that face. Just stunning. And you'll find as well the male and the female. I think uh, we are on Leadwood Road. They are pretty much uh, nesting just further down from where we are now. And um, I saw the juvenile, I think yesterday or the day before, I saw the juvenile flying around. And the juvenile's very brown, but it also has a little bit of a tail. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool. Right, the glow is starting. It's already very pretty, but those colors must intensify. I've done, done all this effort to set this beautiful skyline up. <laughs> I'm sure it will, unless there are clouds further west. We will very likely then have that beautiful fiery sky a bit later. So the sun is down from where we are. We've got that lovely arrangement of different trees that just gives it a beautiful texture in a way. Quite a big knob thorn tree. There's a young marula in the foreground. Some more knob thorns in the back. And even one or two dead trees.
And when we had two days of cold front weather with no sunset whatsoever, this is a welcome event. Edward, hi there, says, Edward says, the sunsets in South Africa never disappoint. No, absolutely. Edward, if you are from South Africa, or if not ever planning to visit South Africa, sunsets are different everywhere you go in South Africa. I mean, it's got a different feel to it here than it would, for instance, be in the Kalahari. The Kalahari sunsets are incredible because of the openness of the terrain there. You've got much wider expanse. It's very intense. If you're along the west coast, also you get to see the sun going down over the ocean. Every part of South Africa have their own unique feel to the sunsets. I mean, I even having chatted to a number of the eco-training students who live in the same campus as, quite a number of them are from Europe. Interesting that uh, quite a lot of people come here to train us as safari guides. A lot of them are just doing it for like an enrichment sort of cause. But anyway, um, having spoken to a lot of them, they all say, you know, up in the parts of Europe where they're from, they, you know, a sunset is once in weeks perhaps because it's most of the time very cloudy where it's more the norm here. And it just makes one realize again that how truly special Africa really is. Mm, we're gonna keep going. See if we can get another perspective on the glowing sky. In the meantime, let's go back to Tessa and to see if there's any change with her line sighting. The game of patience continues. We've had some small rewards so far, and this is probably one of the better ones. Although you can't see much of her now, this is one of the adult lionesses. She's busy grooming, but she is lifting her head and starting to yawn. Now, you know what that means with lions. Yawning and grooming are very good signs. The next thing to come is a stand-up and a stretch. So I feel like we might get lucky. We've seen the odd cub get up. Oh, hello. Odd cub get up and move as well. But they've kind of just been bouncing between the little groups of lions that have split up. Doesn't look like they're in much of a cuddle puddle anymore because they are split up and moving in different locations. But let's see what she does. I know it's not the greatest for you, but knowing that there are lions there, that makes my day. There's a little one. See, the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, 
um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go. Nearly got him. Hyena and Hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little Hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby Hippo jaws gaping. It's going to make it. It's going to make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds. So quite a few of the cubs have now started moving around. That lioness is giving us some yawns like that and she started grooming. So this is a good sign. The sun has set, we can't see it over the horizon anymore. And so this might be the time that they start moving. I do have a feeling though that they're gonna, oh, there's a lioness up to the left. I have a feeling they're gonna move north the, the way that she's looking. Instead of moving this way, I think they're gonna move north. <laughs> she go down again, she did. That's hilarious. <coughs> I suppose one of the best things about having a, having a camera lens is that we can see things from further away than other people. So I suppose we're quite lucky. Hello, girl, there you are, aren't you gorgeous? Oh, look at her in that light. Very stiffly trying to wake up her muscles. And back down. All right, let's see if any of the cubs follow. There you can see a bit of movement in the grass where she was lying, so I'm sure. There you go. The cubs are going to be moving. Run, <laughs> you're welcome. I didn't really spend that much time finding them. I knew more or less the area where to look and luckily I caught the movement with my eye as one of the cubs was getting up and repositioning. Otherwise we might have missed them. But I'm happy that we found them. believe how green those bush willow leaves are compared to the rest of the grass. The grass itself is quite green but this very tall fluffy layer on the top is what's making it look very dull grey. The fluorescences. And I can't believe how nicely that greenery pops. There's a cub. Yes. Stretch. Absolutely brilliant. We might just get them moving off into the distance. This is amazing. And now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah. Here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's got Elephants have huddled up to protect the young ones in the middle and he's going after that girl and they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness they're still going after them. Look at that guy charging! Hey! It's Scottish Lauren as your underwater biologist. We have a turtle! So this is the knife symbol for a turtle. So today is not any ordinary day, it is World Ocean Day. 
真的。<笑>
the rays enter at an angle, and that's what causes more refraction as opposed to daytime when it's straight up ahead. But like we are here, we can't see through the horizon, but there might be clouds here, and so which means it can block a lot of those rays. So therefore, sometimes we don't see that beautiful, beautiful glow that we had last week. But we can wait it out and see. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. down fast now. Quite interesting. Yeah, a nice tree. Good day, dark main lover. Uh, your question there, what is the rarest granite found here? Um, granite in its own is not really rare. Um, so, it's a difficult one to answer because all the granites we have here are very common, They're everywhere. Granite slash gneiss, which is the metamorphosized version of granite. So it's not rare, it's a, quite an extensive igneous complex of rock. And it's, it's a big, big complex in South Africa in terms of the geology, so it's, it's not really that rare. You will find certain minerals within the granite complex that could be rare. Every now and then we see rose quartz. Oh, look at this. That is, that is prize number one. And no, it's not a leopard. It has spots though. It's got spots, but it's silhouetted against the skyline. seen many giraffe lately, I must say. But, uh, And uh, just commenting on the beautiful scene, beautiful giraffe. Yeah, I just feel that temperature dropping every second. It's going to be a cold night. So 
I'm just going to quickly ask our mission control to repeat. We've got a question from our Laura Moore um, relating to granite. I'll repeat it now as soon as it... Ah, our Laura Moore. You actually answered your question with your question. The question there was, is the sand that we have here decomposed granite? Most of the sand that we have here has its origins in the granites and gneiss that we have around here. It's exactly that. Soil, sand, is reworked geological materials. It's small, tiny bits of rock. Obviously, there's some organic matter and stuff that is with it, that makes it soil. And what gives it life in order to grow things in. But that's exactly what it is. Remember I spoke about the Katina, where we, you see up, we are on top of this, this hill, and then you get the valleys, and the hill and the valleys. So up here, uh, you'll have the coarse, rocky, hardest bits that remains, and all the finer bits, the finer minerals, the feldspar and the hornblende, and all those things that, that, that breaks down into tiny little pieces, they get leached down as clay particles, and they accumulate in the valleys where you have the drainage lines up here on these granite crests it's mainly mainly coarse rocky bits that remain so very sort of nutrient deficient soil that's why the plant community differs so much as you move down in this katina into the valleys let's go to Tessa let's see what she can find on her bumble. Giraffes, giraffes, giraffes. It's been a giraffes and elephants kind of day. Sorry, everyone. So I have left the lions. They moved. We couldn't see them anymore anyway. So we let three vehicles go in that can follow them. <coughs> Since we were just taking up space for a vehicle that couldn't really see anything anyway. So I'm now on Cheetah Cut Line. And I am looking for the lovely Miss Lalamba and her little curbs. I don't know whether we're going to find them, I don't know whether we're going to find anything, but that is the best part about it. Very unpredictable. Also, it has currently dropped around 10 degrees Celsius. I don't know if it's really that much, but it feels like it. My goodness, even Panda is putting on the layers, so I certainly hope that Cedric has as well. There's hippo tracks, it's a bit early in the day. I suppose because it's so cold. But yes, I'm hoping Cedric has put on some layers because it is certainly cold enough that we have had to put on as many as we have with us and even now we're considering making a blanket out of anything we find. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. If you are a Wild Earth Explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Throat and my voice box. <laughs> I'm really 
really hoping I'm going to get this name right. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear it properly. I think it was Denny. I think Denny or Benny. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But yes, they do come out at night. Is it to avoid predators? No, because predators are active at night. So they're actually taking a risk by coming out at night because lions, hyenas and leopards are active at night. Their main, their, their main uh, predator would be lions and hyenas, especially for young calves, not really leopards. But they have to come out at night, so they've weighed up the options and they have adapted. Now it's not like us that we can weigh up an option and go, that's the cheaper option or that's the better option. But over time, evolutionarily speaking, the options have been weighed up and the survival strategy was weighted one way and that was coming out at night. And the reason for that is because hippos have incredibly sensitive skin. They cannot be in the direct sunlight, in the heat for too long. So they can't afford to come out and feed at night, they, I mean at, in the day, because they can't afford to have their skin that exposed to the sun. They dry out very quickly, they dehydrate and they die. So the adaptation was do I die of dehydration, which is a given because the sun comes out every day, or do I die as the, at the potential pause of a predator, which could happen any day, whether it's day or not, but isn't a guarantee like the sun is. So that's why it was kind of evolutionarily weighted towards coming out at night so that they're actually avoiding the sun, not predators. So they're going to more chance of bumping into predators at night, but they'll take that chance to avoid the sun. I hope that explains it nicely. <coughs> I love my balancing scales and my hands. Come on, leopards. <laughs> Thanks, Tulu. <laughs> in my ear today is telling me I explained that very nicely so thank you very much all things bright and beautiful all creatures great and small all things wise and wonderful wild earth will see it all each little flower that opens each river that does flow Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! So my plan from here is to go up Central Road to check along the drainage line that goes down towards the Milawati. But it sounds like Chris is appreciating the very same skyline that tricked me into thinking there was a leopard's eye in the bush reflecting off a leaf. Let's go have a look while I continue to Central Road. to get a silly head on this giraffe just moved behind the tree so I just had to bring the call back a little bit sorry about that everybody and we have our fiery sky finally with a giraffe
Amazing, gone just like that. Just like that. Just look at those colours here. Got that rich gold, and as you go further up, it morphs into almost like a purple blue with the black in the foreground of the silhouettes. It's just pure gold, I tell you that. Into, into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also gonna be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys, let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. Barbara, hi there. Barbara's commenting how much she enjoys this great silhouette. Ah, Barbara, it is gorgeous, isn't it? Eh? bat flying as well. That'll be near impossible to get. Right, I think that's very likely the last segment for us from Pridelands this afternoon. It was a wonderful, relaxed afternoon. So I'll see you <clears throat> tomorrow morning. We have lost light. So we are going to be heading back to camp and we're going to send you over to Cedric, who's going to continue on his bumble. Yes, it has been definitely a wonderful sunset this afternoon. A fantastic afternoon. A few nice little things happening around here. Hyena den, lions, a lot of elephants. So yes, it's definitely been quite a few things around. But now we just need to find a zest, and um, that's why I'm 
from here are in the Fuzzle Cut Line. Uh, just coming close, not too far from Gallagher Shortcut. Oh, yeah, it is Gallagher Shortcut. Um, don't double check here, there's nothing crossing over. Because, uh, as I said, the guys did have uh, information or given me information this morning about Kara and Tavangumi being in this area. Apparently, Kara is pregnant, so it will be nice to see her. As I said, I haven't seen her before, but it will be nice to see a female that's uh, in a uh, well, pretty much you know, pregnant, and uh, see how far she is. Um, I don't know. Who did she mate with? I'm not too sure. Who it was. I'm not too sure, huh? So it could have been. I'm not too sure who she did mate with. Very likely. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. Anyway, well, I'm thinking we're going to hopefully see some other night creatures uh, that pops out tonight. Um, the, looking uh, still, I'm on Aubrey's now going south back to Voyatilla Access. And uh, I want to see if anything has come through this side here. No, I thought I saw some tracks. find uh, cats. Uh, it's difficult to find cats, uh, Alexander, in the winter time. Uh, cats? Sorry, Chulu, can you just go with that again? Please? Uh, let me catch Alexander's question. Alexander, good evening. Is it common to find uh, bats in the winter? Yes, definitely. There's still, uh, I saw one or two little micro bats still flying around at this uh, time of the year. Uh, not as plentiful as uh, your summer with all those insects, especially when those flying ants do come out. Um, then you'll see numerous uh, bats coming through. Um, but uh, actually, I haven't seen many so far. Talking about bats, so I haven't really seen Something, but out. Um, they're not going to go in. Hibernate or migrate or anything like that. Uh, they are still catching little insects. I'm sure there's still a lot of little mosquitoes. Well, last night we had a lot of mosquitoes around. So it's a bit of fun. Let's see what you test. Sorry, I thought I saw something there. Let's head over to Tess and see how her sunset is looking. I must be honest, I feel like when we've had a day or two of overcast weather and we get to see a sunrise or a sunset everything changes the world comes to a standstill now we've gone out of infrared so that we can show you that last little bit of orange glow 
as the sun sets off to some bad weather. Now it's incredibly bright. All along we can vaguely see the outline of the mountains far in the distance. And it's just an absolutely gorgeous scene. The only thing that could possibly make it any better would be hearing a leopard sawing far away. Or close, but just a leopard sawing. But have a look at those colors. Is that not magnificent? So what I want to do, I want to stop talking. I want to sit, I want to listen, and I want to just take it in. little bit of a moment to kind of reset, take in what's happened for the day, appreciate what you've got, and breathe. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Oh. It's not as graceful as <laughs> he's a bit hesitant because well climbing a tree is not the easiest but he will get up there eventually so let's see there he goes and look at the power in that that is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there how cool is this i don't know how he's going to do it but let's see if you are a wild earth explorer we have exciting news for you the winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. I could do this every single day. <laughs> I can very faintly hear a mixture of insects and frogs calling in the background. I can hear the wind. But other than that, I hear nothing. And that makes me so happy. <laughs> it's so nice to have that little bit of quiet. <laughs> Kendra, <coughs> clothing for South Africa's winter depends where you are going. If you're going somewhere like the bush, you need a lot of warm clothes, beanies, gloves, scarves, but most importantly, you're going to need layers. So don't put an Alaskan snowsuit on with nothing underneath because by eight in the morning, you're gonna be embarrassed when you have to take it off and are wearing nothing else underneath. Or you'll have to sweat your body weight off just to try and keep cool. So I would recommend layering with some really decent brands as well that are really warm thermals if you're going somewhere like cape town waterproof definitely waterproof and rainproof i mean windproof and warm if you're going somewhere like queenstown or bloemfontein <laughs> then you can wear your alaska snowsuit probably with some stuff underneath 
But if you're going to some of the other areas, you know, our winters really aren't that bad. Um, there's some areas where it's freezing, like Sutherland. Bring your Alaska snowsuit, bring your snowshoes. <laughs> but in the bush, by lunchtime, you could pull off a dress and a light jersey, and, a, and on some days, just the dress. Um, but as long as you're wearing layers, you'll be okay. I think a lot of people think because we have the bush, we don't get snow. We might not get snow here at Juma, but growing up, we had snow a lot. So there are certainly areas of South Africa where it is freezing. And there are areas of South Africa where it's wet the entirety of winter. So it really just depends where you're going. South Africa is quite a large place. But I would say I specialize in bush and kind of that kind of winter plus the odd occasional snow from growing up. But it's a good question because it's one of those things that a lot of people don't really think about when they're coming on safari or coming on holiday. You kind of have a basic guideline, but it's good to know a little bit more detail because I've seen some of the basic guidelines that tour operators and, and people give to their friends that are coming on safari, and some of it's really laughable. You know, I've, I've seen a list where they said you're not allowed to wear a baseball cap. You're only allowed to wear a bucket hat or a crocodile dundee hat. They literally called it a crocodile dundee hat on the form. I mean, that's nonsense. Also, forms had said there is absolutely no way a cell phone will work in South Africa, so you have to hire a satellite phone for $500 a day. <laughs> also nonsense. <laughs> You know, there's some really wild extremes and it's it's definitely worth a good laugh, I can tell you that much, because we look at it and we go, that is absolutely ridiculous. There is no need to take it to that extreme unless you're going to live in the wildest, darkest part of the jungle that's never been explored for two months on your own. There's no need for such extremes. <laughs> Never a dull moment, I can tell you that much. So if anyone needs more advice on what to bring and what not to bring on safari, all those exotic extras that they tell you you need, maybe double check first if you actually need a satellite phone or things like that, because chances are you won't. Anyway, I am going to keep con keep continuing. I'm going to continue looking for Tlalamba tracks and send you over to Cedric on a bumble. So I think maybe two. I've been talking one of the dominant males. Uh, I am in need for uh, tortoise, tortoise pack. I'm definitely going to do a bit of a Listen up and he did <laughs> Apologies, everyone. Seems like a Cedric is uh, is not in a good place right now with signal, but that's okay. I'm back and I just restarted my tracking mission. Now I did actually see some leopard tracks coming from Gwari Pan area down towards Central Road, but they have been driven over. So they were probably from earlier when she was on a bit of a mission somewhere, uh, not from tonight. chosen the bumpiest road to get back because it's a lot more fun but also just because it's a popular road with animals <laughs> all things bright and beautiful all creatures great and small all things wise and wonderful wild earth will see it all 
each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwa's Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. I think we've got some good luck coming. All right, after my nice little silent moment with the sunset, I'm turning my radio volume back up. Josh? <laughs> If I could see a nocturnal animal, I would love to see a striped polecat, because I've never seen one. An aardvark, because I've never seen one. Pangolins are always good to see, but funnily enough, I've only seen pangolin, pangolins in the day, never at night. Interesting, even though they're nocturnal. Um, yeah, I think those would be my top two for here. If I'm looking at outside areas, I would say odd wolf as well, and, uh, and a brown hyena. But um, no, I think here, yeah, strapped polecat and an odd fark, top of my list. Ooh, owlet. And gone. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> That's really funny. I think I should, you know what, I'm actually being really funny. I think I should give you a description because, all right, this is how cold it is, folks. Just to, just to show you how cold it is, because I don't feel like people appreciate the value of an, an, <laughs> an ankle jawler. Okay, so I normally wear three-quarter pants. I buy long pants, but they're always too short for me because I'm tall. It's a bit of a nightmare. So these are ankle jawlers. They're my favorite pants. I normally wear them here as three quarters, but this is an ankle jawler. When it's too short to even reach your ankle, so it's at a weird, awkward length with a weird cut because it's supposed to be a long pant. <laughs> it's one of my mom's favorite words, ankle jawler, because that's about as long as it goes. Not really very flattering when it's that length, is it? Look at that, it's so baggy. <laughs> so I normally fold them up to make them three quarters, but it's so cold that I've made them ankle jawlers and, and apparently I'm proud enough to share that with you. <laughs> That's how cold it is currently, everybody. We're wearing ankle jawlers. And I'm wearing socks, I swear. They're just secret socks. So they're, they're in there somewhere. But anyway, back to the drive. Sorry, I got temporarily distracted because I know how much my mom loves ankle jawlers. She loves using that word. Ankle jawler, it means it's having a party around your ankles. Jaw is a party in Afrikaans. An ankle jawler, it's having a party at your ankles because it's not quite long enough to go anywhere else. <laughs> That's how cold it is. <laughs> oh, too good. Even Tulu in my ear likes that phrase, ankle jawler. It's a good one. You gotta say it with an accent though, ankle jawler. Anyway, I'm gonna send you over to Cedric while I cross this very big drainage line where I might lose signal. He's still on a bumble. Alright, 
to Sloan. So he's coming up to Rebecca's Junction now. I'm still going south. I'm still trying to see if I am lucky for once with this uh, male leopard that keeps on coming up here. Or must be tortoise band or mola whitey. And I feel that I need to, I need to get him. I need to get one of them very soon because uh, if I don't, I'm going to start uh, going into male leopard withdrawal. to find them. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet, and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! Yeah. Oh, very strange. I haven't uh, even seen uh, not one track this afternoon for a leopard, so it was very difficult to actually even see where I could start tracking. But uh, no tracks this afternoon at all yeah, on Juma. And, uh, well, you never know. The drive hasn't ended yet. Hopefully, maybe the last minute uh, leopard. A cat lover, good evening. How does a female leopard select a mating partner? Well, cat lover, first of all, uh, they are territorial, uh, male and female. Male's got a large territory, female's smaller. So if this female is in a male's territory and she wants to mate, she will start calling and uh, she will go and search and she will go and look out for any male that's in the area, although the territorial male. And uh, usually if he does come towards where she is or she gets to him, um, of course, uh, she'll find out that he is the dominant male. Of course, a lot of scraping with the leg, back legs. He'll also start calling as well quite a bit when he does locate a female around where he is that's in heat. And uh, then they will copulate. But sometimes a female will also move right out of her own territory to look for a, a mate as well. Sometimes she will um, mate with a male outside from her territory just to try and find uh, that male, the dominant male of that area. So it is, uh, I mean, I've seen like, uh, I think in Sele recently, in Sele is that female, it's got that uh, blind eye. And I think she moved right out of the area. She went all the way into the western sector, close to Robson's area, Ottawa to look for a male mating with a male that side. So she went completely out of the area, which is very strange. So I don't know if she even came back yet. So that's another thing. I'm, uh, that's, that's a female that I'm also missing out on, is in Sele. So, but yeah, um, but also there has been cases with females mating with more than one male. So it does confuse the males on exactly which, uh, which one <laughs> mated with her. And uh, of course the offspring as well. So maybe a little bit of a better chance for the offspring or the survival of that offspring. If she mates with more than one male. But it does happen. It has happened before. So... George, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Uh, the current dominant male of Juma, they think there is two males. Uh, of course, um, the majority of Juma is uh, dominated by a male called Molawati. 
So I'll say maybe about two thirds and uh, uh, one third is dominated by another male called Tortoise Pan. So exactly on this road that I am now, the guys have seen Tortoise Pan coming up and down here. This is as far east as he comes. And of course he goes back west. And uh, Molawati comes all the way to uh, this road as well, onto Zoe's. And this is as far west as he comes. So this area that we are now is actually pretty much an area that the two males do overlap uh, their territories. So that's why many times if you do see male leopard tracks going up and down here, uh, it's not really tortoise pan, it could be either. Uh, either one, Molawati or tortoise pan. But Molawati's got quite a majority of, uh, of Juma. He's, uh, he's got a very big territory. But then as well, we must remember the northern side, I think the northern side so far, the north, well, I said the northwestern corner of uh, Juma is uh, slowly but surely being uh, dominated by a younger male called Tavangumi. That's the one that we were pretty much looking for tonight. And I know he's been seen around on the northwestern corner. He is absolutely, I really hope he comes through this side because he's more of the, uh, I think he's a pretty boy. I think, well, look, Molawati isn't that pretty, but Molawati is the ghost. You hardly ever see him. Where well, Tavangumi is a little bit more relaxed and uh, get to see more often. Well, you can see the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go. Nearly got him. Hyena and Hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little Hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Maybe Hippo jaws gaping. It's going to make it. It's going to make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds. But yes, I'm looking for any of the reflection of any of these nocturnal animals' eyes. I'm hoping that they will be staring back at me somewhere. Chulu, go with your question again from uh, Dark Man Lover. I did not catch the question. Uh, Dark Man Lover, good evening. Uh, sorry, uh, thank you very much for joining us once again here on Wild Earth. Uh, look, the thing is, uh, usually sometimes, like for instance, if you take the Nkumas with the sub-adults, uh, clearly you could see that Chilla is leading that whole thing. Uh, Chilla is leading the hunts on uh, on, the, on the, that area, of, on the sub-adults itself. So they're kind of just following her. Um, if it's like those three females that we saw this morning, the Nkumas, um, sometimes you'll find there will be uh, a female that will lead a hunt, sometimes a certain female that will always kind of uh, decide on taking the furthest uh, and the widest berth around something that they are hunting. So they'll each have a little kind of part to play in that hunt. But uh, yeah, you know, the females will, if one, uh, if one gets interested, they all get interested. They all decide and all start looking exactly uh, what's playing out, what are they hunting, and, uh, and so forth, and how big the animal is, and how many there are. So there's a lot of uh, factors uh, to it. But it's not always just a, a certain female. I think, uh, I think one female gets uh, gets ready for that, uh, and uh, one female gets ready to hunt. I'm sure it will instigate the rest to do the same. But anyway, while we continue, just up to Philemon's cut line to see if any nocturnal animals are around. Let's head over to Tess on her safari.
<laughs> I've just arrived at Gauri Dam. I'm on the dam wall. <laughs> there was quite a stubborn night jar that wouldn't move. And I could I didn't have my lights on and I couldn't I couldn't move from there for a while. It was quite interesting. A standoff between me and a night jar and the night jar nearly won. So I've been looking for leopard tracks. The only thing we really found was a tree pushed over the road, so we could not get through Central Road at Giraffe Crossing because the elephants decided to rearrange the furniture. They created a roadblock. But that's all right. We'll have to go and cut it tomorrow after drive in the morning. I uh, tried pushing it, that did not work. It's too big, too heavy, and Wendy could not do it. So we shall try in the morning. Maybe we can tow it with Wendy and Rusty. That would work. Tow it out the way, then we don't have to cut it up. There are still a wealth of elephant tracks everywhere. It seems like on every road we're finding Ellie tracks. And since that last little set of leopard tracks, I can't seem to find any others. What? And I'm hoping for a little... This is amazing. And now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah. Here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's got... The elephants have huddled up to protect the young ones in the middle and he's going after that girl. And they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness, they're still going after them. Look at that guy charging, hey! Lauren, as your underwater biologist. We have a turtle! So this is the night symbol for a turtle. So today is not any ordinary day, it is World Ocean Day. of little scrub hairs that pop out of nowhere tonight. Out of nowhere. <coughs> My voice broke as I said that. Oh! Lilita dwarf mongooses are our smallest true carnivore. They're predators. So no, they are not omnivorous. They definitely prefer eating other things like scorpions, spiders, birds' eggs, baby birds, all of the small things that they can get their little teeth into. So you can see why they're classified so closely with hyenas. They are incredible little predators. Our smallest true carnivore in the bush. So I'm slowly checking all of the taller trees here. I've seen Kara here before. I'm so sorry, Gulu. Could you please repeat the question from Shaggy Dog? I heard male hyenas and I didn't hear if they ever go something. <laughs> sorry. Apologies. Do they ever group? Thank you so much, Lulu. I'm so sorry. Shaggy Dog, I don't know how to answer that fully because, let me give you my reasoning here. Bear with me. Because if you look at hyenas, they are grouped anyway. They're in a clan. So, 
they're already in a group. They hunt in groups, they hunt alone, they interact in groups, they... <laughs> They already do so much in groups. I don't know if you mean maybe like if Ribbon and if Ribbon's two cubs, for example, both being male, if they both migrate away from the clan, will they go together to a new clan or will they go separately? Maybe that's what you mean. In my mind, they would go separately because it increases genetic diversity, but they might go together. There's always an exception from the rule. So I think it just depends on the situation but hyenas are grouped anyway they're all incredibly social so i can't imagine why they wouldn't be in in a group unless they're just choosing to feed on their own or have a, a lonely day like everybody needs every now and then there is a big elephant bull but i don't know if he is going to let us view him up close he's on a little bit of a mission Right, let's see, he's coming closer to the road. Maybe I can get a better view for you. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. Is it a ghost elephant? Ah. <laughs> he's so good at camouflaging. Ha! Ah, there's a gap. And then he's going to walk into the clearing. That's actually quite a cute frame with him in the bush. Although Panda probably wants to kill me for that one. <laughs> ah, there he comes. Hello, boy. Quite a young bull on his own upon quarantine. Slowly just feeding as he goes. You can see he's very calm. There's no signs of him coming into or out of his first must. I think he is just one of those young bulls that's been kicked out of the herd. And it is now time for him to feed and move around on his own. Every now and then you might find him interacting with other bulls, older and younger. And only when he gets a lot older will he integrate back into a herd, just to mate though, not permanently. Stephen, elephant bulls can be found in herds, but it's not a traditional herd like you would find with females and babies that stay together. They come together and pull apart freely. 
the reason why a young male like this would join the elephants is for a little bit of company, but also to learn from bigger bulls. So that's when he would be termed an Ascari, when he is learning from bigger bulls in a bachelor herd. <coughs> Within that herd, they'll have their own dominance, so they'll have a dominance hierarchy, and they probably won't spend the rest of their lives together, just short patches of time when they need the company, because it would be too competitive to stay like that forever, because elephant bulls are very competitive when it comes to being in must, and when it comes to females in estrus. He got such a fright, he let some gas go there. That was really funny. <sighs> he heard something he wasn't happy with and he literally let off gas. He tried to move so fast. Oh, he is not happy with something. Look at that stance. Whatever is in the dark that's too far for us to see, he is not happy with. He immediately put his ears out and he started giving it a bit of a challenge. But there is a road that runs back there, so I might zip around there quickly and see if there's anything coming up. But he's still not happy. His ears are out. So I'm going to go around and investigate and send you to Cedric on a bow. Oh, never mind. I believe you're staying with me. All right. I can't see anything there, so I'm going to try and go around. That really awkward moment, like, I don't know why it happens like this, but when something like that happens, and then <laughs> you, um, you start the vehicle, you've been in the pitch dark, remember, so we're using infrared, so you've been in the pitch dark, you always panic that as you start the vehicle and switch your lights on, there's going to be like a lion right next to your face. <laughs> Would not be ideal at all. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. If you are a Wild Earth Explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours, a very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. So this elephant has definitely had a walk through a puddle or something. Hello, big boy. So he heard, I think, Cedric's vehicle in the distance and just decided to say, hang on, remember I'm here. But I really can't see anything else that would seem like it would have upset him. I think he just picked up on a weird smell on the wind. Ah, oh, there we go. Back to feeding. Lovely and happy. Anna Marie, it was such a pleasure having you with us this evening. Thank you for joining us. We had a spectacular afternoon. Wow, that's a big branch. We had a spectacular afternoon with all of our sightings and all of our conversations. Some very interesting questions asked today as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for sending those in. We really appreciate it. Now, for World Environment Day on the 5th of June, we are going to be asking for kids' questions. So if you're under the age of 18 and you have some really interesting questions you want to ask about the environment, about anything in nature, please do send them through to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv with, you know, including that it's for 
World Environment Day because the first hour of the sunset safari will be specifically for the kids and we're looking forward to hearing from you to hear what interests you and what would you like to know but other than that <laughs> It has been a phenomenal day. Our elephant bull is coming closer to say goodnight. Between the glimpses of Nkuhuma and uh, the elephants, the hippos, all the tracking, all of the fun, it really has been a phenomenal, phenomenal afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here to join us, for braving the cold with us, and for keeping us as entertained as we keep you. We hope you have an absolutely wonderful evening further. Hopefully, tomorrow is just as successful, if not more. Fingers crossed. And hopefully soon we'll be able to sort out the mystery of how many cubs Ndebele has. But for now, we're enjoying the elephant bull as he walks away. And I think that's quite fitting for the afternoon that we have had. It has been so, so, so lovely. I can tell you that I hope my voice is a little bit less like a foghorn tomorrow morning, that I don't have to wear ankle jawlers, and that it is a lot of fun regardless of what we go through. Good night, everyone.
Good afternoon, everyone, and a very happy Monday to you all today. So welcome down to Penguin Beach. And you can see the scene down here is a little different at Penguin Beach because I am once again surrounded by frogs. And uh, my name is Jax. I'm going to be your naturalist down here today. We have Igor behind the camera. And yesterday we had a question about frogs and which frog species we have here. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens. Each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth kids.